Hey guys, how's it going? Connor here today, dtrailer.com. We're gonna be showing you how to convert your trailer from electric drum brakes to hydraulic disc brakes. So in order to complete the swap, we're actually gonna need a number of components. The first main component here is gonna be our electric over hydraulic actuator. Our hydraulic actuator here is gonna take an electrical input signal from the tow vehicle, and it's gonna to transfer that into a hydraulic pressure to our braking assemblies. So in regards to our electric over hydraulic actuator here, we're gonna have a few different options to choose from. And within each of those options, we have a diff couple different types. The couple different types includes one for drum brakes and one for disc brakes. So we need to make sure we choose the correct one. Now the reason for this is disc brakes require a higher PSI rating, typically around 1600, whereas dump drum brakes require a lower pressure rating, typically around 1000 to 1200 PSI. So it is important we choose the right actuator based on what kind of brakes we're installing. So if you haven't decided on which electric over hydraulic actuator you're gonna be using, I definitely prefer the Hydrostar option that we have in front of us here. I would say the number one thing I really like about this actuator in regards to the ease of installation is gonna be the thin profile. And what this thin profile means is it's gonna be very narrow. We're gonna have, we're not gonna need a lot of space to mount this on the vehicle. It's not gonna take up a bunch of room, but we're still gonna have plenty of other space for our additional cargo. So the next main component we're gonna need in order to convert our trailer is the brake kit. Now we see we have disc brakes included laid out in front of us here, but there's also the option of drum brakes. However, if you're deciding between the two, I definitely recommend going the disc brake mount for the disc brake option, because there's gonna be fewer moving components, maintenance is gonna be a lot easier. So within the disc brake category, we're gonna have two different options again. Number one, you see here, we have the integrated hub and rotor. What this essentially means is our hub is already gonna be permanently affixed to the rotor, as opposed to the separate hub and rotor, which we see here. Now the benefits of the separate hub and rotor is, if you were to have any issue with your hub here, you could replace this separately from the rotor or vice versa. Whereas this package here is a little bit more integrated, seamless, easier to install, but we do have the downside of not being able to replace either component if one fails. So in order to choose the correct disc brake kit for our trailer, the number one thing we need to know is our axle capacity. Our axle capacity is gonna verify that we have the correct brake mounting flange, as well as the correct bolt pattern and size rotor. So we do need to verify this beforehand. This can be do, done one of two ways. We can simply look on the axle tube. There's generally gonna be a sticker there with our axle capacity, or we can reach out to the trailer manufacturer with our VIN and they'll be able to tell us this. Now, if you haven't already decided on a disc brake kit, the Kodiak kit, which you see in front of us here, is gonna be an excellent option. We have a very powerful single piston caliper, which is gonna allow us our brakes to have that nice grip biting feeling. So we're gonna be able to stop relative to the portional braking in our tow vehicle. Now, another thing I really like about the Kodiak kit here is a decrement finish. So this decrement finish here is gonna last a long time. It's gonna withstand any dirt, corrosion, or rust issues. So we don't have to worry about the brakes wearing down, the coating wearing off, and our components rusting. So our next component here is gonna be our brake lines. Now in regards to brake lines, you have a couple different options. As you can see here, we have the hard line option in front of us, but there's also an option with all flexible lines. Now there's gonna be benefits to having all flexible. There's also gonna be benefits to having all hard lines. So for the hard lines, the main benefit is they're gonna be a lot more durable to our soft lines. They're not gonna be nearly as prone to having punctures and then in turn creating leaks. However, the benefits of our soft lines are, they're gonna be a lot easier to install. Personally, we're gonna be installing the hard lines on this trailer here, and that's what I recommend you do as well. Now the little bit more challenging installation is definitely gonna pay off down the road because we're not gonna have to worry about as punctures as much and getting under the trailer and having to fix any leaks. This Hydrostar option comes with everything we need. We have a 25 foot long leader hose. We also have some soft lines that attach to each of our disc brake calibers. Keep in mind, we do need those soft lines with the axle travel. It's also gonna come with all the other fittings as well as some additional accessories to help secure our lines. So again, this is a great option. Just be sure to verify the number of brakes we have on our trailer. So our last two components we have here to complete our swap is number one, our brake controller and our breakaway switch. However, chances are, if you have electric brakes on your trailer, you already have both of those. There is a couple of things we need to keep in mind though. 
So for the breakaway switch, we're not gonna have any issues here. We can simply reuse the one we have, or we can purchase another one here through eTrailer. However, the brake controller, we do need to make sure of a couple things. Number one, if we're using an aftermarket brake controller, such as you see here, the Deconcha P3 is a great option and what I recommend. Now, but the reason I say this is we need to make sure that our aftermarket brake controller is compatible with electrical over hydraulic brakes because not all are. Therefore, you do need to check with the manufacturer of your brake controller to make sure it's compatible. If not, again, the Deconcha Prodigy P3 is an excellent option that we sell here at eTrailer. So in regards to factory brake controllers, this again could pose a potential issue. Now there are some factory brake controllers on the market that are not directly compatible with electric over hydraulic actuators. You need to check the page for the actuator you're using to be sure if it's compatible with your factory brake controller. If not, there may be an adapter available that will allow you to use your factory brake controller. Otherwise, an aftermarket brake controller here would be a great option. So if you're on the fence about whether or not you're going to make the swap from electric drum brakes to hydraulic disc brakes, I would definitely recommend you consider going the hydraulic disc brake route. So the reason I recommend going with the hydraulic disc brakes are they're going to be a lot more similar in regards to both performance and feel and the brakes in our tow vehicle. The hydraulic proportional valves in each of our actuators is going to allow a nice smooth clean braking. We're not going to have that jerking feeling we would with our electric brakes. So in addition to the nice smooth and even braking, we're also going to get a lot more bite when we do have to slam on our brakes. As opposed to electric brakes, they sort of come on over time. Our hydraulic brakes here, we're going to get a nice grip of initial bite. So if we have any issues with trailer sway, we can correct that right away. Or if we have to make an emergency stop, our hydraulic disc brakes here are going to allow us to do that safely. Now we're going to start our installation by installing the disc brakes. In order to do this, we need to get our trailer up in the air here. We need to go ahead and remove the wheels. We're only going to be removing the wheels on one side to start. Now keep in mind, before we get the trailer in the air, we do want to loosen the lug nuts on our trailer so we don't have to fight it with getting them off while they're suspended. We're just going to go ahead and zip our lug nuts off so we can remove our wheels. We're only going to remove the wheels on one side of the trailer for now. So now that we have our wheels off, our first step here is going, to be, is going to be to remove our grease cap. In order to do this, we're going to have a flathead screwdriver and a hammer. We're going to try to lift the flanges from the outside here. We can sort of use that to get a little bit of leverage and pry it off like so. So now that we have our grease cap off, you can see here we have this sort of bronze retainer clip that needs to come off as well. Just take a flat red screwdriver, poke it in the opening here, we can remove that. Once that's off, go ahead and take a pair of channel locks here. We have this nut we need to remove. It shouldn't be on there very tight at all, so we shouldn't need any sort of leverage from a wrench. I'm just going to unthread this for now. Once we have the grease cap off here, you're definitely going to want a pair of gloves as well as some paper towels nearby because it's going to get pretty messy. Once we have that off here, next thing we're going to do is we're going to pull out on our hub a little bit here so we can pop that outer bearing and our flat washer free. Just like that. Use a paper towel here. We're going to dig this out. Once those are out, go ahead and pull our hub the rest of the way off. So now once we have the hub off, what we're going to do now is we're just going to take a paper towel and get the rest of the grease off our spindle here so we're not making a mess when we're installing our other components. Now would also be a good time to inspect our spindle to make sure there's no nicks or there's no discoloration. So before we remove the braking assembly here from our trailer axle, we need to go ahead, use some diagonal cutters here. We're just going to cut this wire here to free it from our axle tube here so we can just pull the braking assembly straight off once we get the nuts off. So now we can go ahead and remove our actual braking assemblies here. So you can see on the inside, 
we have five nuts which all need to come out. Once we have that last nut removed here, we can go ahead and remove our braking assembly here. Just like that. So now the next part of our installation here, we can go ahead and install our disc brake mounting flange here. The opening here that our caliper mounts to, these two bolt holes here, we want facing the rear of the trailer. We also need to make sure that these two ears here are gonna be facing outward. So it should only line up one way here. So there's not too much we can do to mess this up. It's just a matter of aligning all the holes here. Just like that. Then we're gonna take our nuts that we use to remove the backing plate from our drum brakes here. We're gonna be reusing those. Then we're gonna tighten these up with our ratchet here. And we're actually gonna come back and we're gonna torque everything down as well. So now that we have our brake mounting flange installed, we can go ahead and take our hub and rotor here. And we can begin prepping this to set on the trailer. Now before we do this, we're gonna need a couple extra things. Number one, we're gonna need our bearing oil here. We're gonna need both our inner and outer bearings. We're also gonna need an oil seal. Now these are all sold here through e-trailer. It should be pretty easy to pick out your bearings, but for the oil seal, we do wanna make a couple measurements here. We need to note the diameter where our oil seal sits in the actual hub. We also need to measure the outer diameter of our spindle where the oil seal sits, so we make sure we get the correct one. Now we can start first by installing our inner bearing here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take some oil here. We're just gonna try to get it in between this crevice here. We don't need a lot of oil here. We just wanna coat all the rollers so it goes in nice and smoothly. Just gonna take some oil, get it around there. Now we're just gonna do our best to work it in. We're also going to want to take a thin film layer of oil and place it on the race there so it helps guide it in nice and smooth. And we can set it in place just like that. Now what we're going to do before we install our oil seal here on the back of the hub, we're again going to take a small amount of oil here. We're just going to coat the surface where it's going to be pressed in. Once we've done that, Going to go ahead and give a nice little coating on the outside of the seal here. We can go ahead and set this in place. Keep in mind the closed end here is going to be facing outward. So we're just going to set it like so. Try to get it as even as possible. That's going to be the trick to install this correctly is making sure all sides go in evenly. So now once we have our oil seal in place, we're going to take a small block of wood here. We're going to hammer this down to seat it correctly. And we're just going to check to make sure it's flush on all sides and it did in fact see evenly so it looks like we're good to go there so now we're going to flip our hub around here and at this time if we wanted we could go ahead and lube up our outer bearing here and set it into place but we're going to hold off on that now until we get the hub on our spindles here we're just going to go ahead and repeat this process of installing the inner bearing and our oil seal for the rest of our hubs so now we can take our hub and rotor here, we can set it on the spindle, and we can take our outer bearing here, go ahead again, just give it a nice good coat of oil here, not too much, but go ahead and stick this in place. That may have, everything may not fit all together right now because we still have to seat our oil seal around back but we should be able to get everything in place without doing that just yet. So then we can take our D-ring washer. Keep in mind, we're gonna be reusing this. Set that into place. And for this next part there, we have a couple threads. I'm gonna go ahead and thread on our nut here, but we are gonna to have to seat the oil seal as much as we can to get this to go all the way down just like that. 
So now that we have everything mocked up into place, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and tighten our nut down here, which is going to help us seat the oil seal in the back, and it's going to go over the spindle correctly. We have a couple different options for this. The most accessible option would be to take a pair of vice grips here. What we're going to do is just going to work the nut back and forth, tightening it, loosening it, tightening it in order to really seat that oil seal there. And the other option we have here, which is going to be less accessible, but probably easier on you because you don't have to worry about the wrench slipping here or the pliers slipping, is to take a one and a half inch socket, sort of just do the same thing we were doing here. So we're going to tighten all the way down as much as we can in order to seat the hub, the oil seal on the spindle, and we'll just come off and we'll keep tightening it, keep loosening it until it's seated all the way. So now we went ahead and tightened and loosened our nut a couple times. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to give our hub a nice little wiggle here to make sure we don't have too much plate. We're also going to look around the back to make sure that oil seal seated correctly on the spindle. So if we, it wasn't quite there, we did have movement, we'd want to go ahead and tighten this nut down a little further, back it off, tighten it down, back it off, just like we showed you earlier. However, it looks like we're about good as far as seating the oil seal. So now we're going to tighten it about a quarter of a turn, just very so slightly, so we have the right amount of pressure. And we're going to spin our hub here to make sure it's not too tight or we don't have any rattling or movement. But it looks like that's about good. So now that we have our nut tightened properly, we can go ahead and clip on our retainer here, making sure we align the tab with the flat spot on our spindle here. Just like that. Go ahead and just spin everything, make sure it's nice and smooth. And if so, we can work our way over to the other side. So now we're gonna take our oil cap here we're going to thread that onto the hub, just like so. Then we're going to take our pliers here. We're going to tighten that down, being very careful we don't go too tight and crack the plastic. That should be good. I'm going to go ahead and take out our plug here using a flathead screwdriver. Once that's removed, we can go ahead and take our oil here. We can begin filling the hubs up while we're rotating them to make sure everything works in place. So now that we have our fill line here and it's just starting to slowly leak out, we can go ahead and reinstall our plug. Again, we need to do this on the other side as well. So as you can see here, our oil level did actually go down a little bit over time. That is going to happen. So we're going to frequently take the cap off, add more oil, spin the hub, and keep doing that until our oil line doesn't drop anymore. So the next step here, we can actually install our disc brake caliper. But before we do that, we want to clean the surface of our rotor here using some brake parts cleaner. Get all of our fingerprints and all that leftover oil and dirt off the face of our rotor. Make sure we do the back side as well. So once that's done, we can go ahead and take our disc brake caliper out of the box here. We may need to seat the pad all the way. Just make sure we're not touching the surface of our brake pads here. Then we can go ahead and install these on our mounting bracket. Simply slide them over the rotor. So it was a pretty tight fit getting our caliper up in the guides of our bracket here. So we just went ahead, and took a hammer, just lightly tapped it the rest of the way into place. So everything will line up. So now that we have our caliper in place, we've aligned our bolt holes here. We can go ahead insert our bolts here and tighten them down with a half inch socket. Keep in mind we do want to work our way back and forth through each bolt so we can tighten them as evenly as possible. So 
So now that we have both of our bolts tightened down, we can go ahead and torque everything down to the specifications in the manual. And once this is done, we can again repeat this process on the other side. So now that we have our brakes installed on the trailer, we can go ahead and work our way over here to our brake lines, which are gonna be the next component we need to install. We wanna take our four rubber brake hoses that come with our kit here. What we're gonna do for the first step is we're gonna go ahead and install one of these on each of our disc braking calipers. So what we're gonna do is simply take either the threaded portions or the exact same. There's gonna be a fitting on the back side of our calipers that we're gonna guide that into. We just want to get that started hand tight for now. Once we do get it started, we can come back with our 3 8 inch wrench here. But we're not going to tighten it down super tight now. We're just going to give it a couple turns to hold it in place. And then we can make the needed adjustments further down the road. Just like that. So once we have one installed, we're going to go ahead and repeat this for our other three disc brake calipers. So now once we have all four of our rubber hoses installed, what we're going to do is we're going to come to the rearmost axle on the trailer here. We're going to secure our rubber line to this portion of the frame rail here using a self-tapping screw and one of our clamps which is included with the kit. We're just going to simply slide it over like that. Then we're going to find a good position on the frame rail here that we still can allow our rubber hose to move freely as our axle travels. We don't want to get it binding too tight cause any issues with breaking. So around here it's going to be about a good location. Move it back a little bit because again we want some extra slack on our line. And then we're going to take our self-tapping screw here, just drill it into place. And again we need to do this for the rearmost hose on our rear axle here, both sides. Just like that. Now again, we need to repeat this process on the other side of our rearmost axle. So now we're under the trailer here and we have a portion of our 3 16 inch brake line. Now there's gonna be a couple different lengths that have come with our kit. We're gonna have the longer length, which is gonna reach from the front of our axle all the way up to the actuator. We're gonna have a length that is gonna be used to cross the distance of our two axles. And then we're gonna have two other brake lines which are gonna be the same length and they're gonna be used for to bridge the front and rear axle. So we're gonna take one of these lines now and we're gonna attach it to the fitting that we just secured up on the frame rail using a union adapter, which comes in the kit and looks like this. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take a half inch wrench and a 3 8 inch wrench. And we're first gonna install this union onto the flexible hose that we just secured. So we're just gonna do it again hand tight for now. Spin that on there. Going to use our half inch wrench to hold the union in place and then our 3 8 inch wrench to tighten the fitting from the flexible hose into this union. And again nothing needs to be super tight right now. Then we can take our brake line here Go ahead and thread that into place as well. Just like that. So as you can see here, we went ahead and routed the rest of our brake line up facing the front of the trailer. However, we have quite a bit of excess because we needed to stop where our T is gonna be, which is gonna be roughly directly in front of our frontmost axle here, right above the caliper. So what we're going to do is, you have a couple different options here. We're actually just gonna mark this line here about where we want to cut it. We're actually gonna put a new flare and fitting tool at this point we need. However, the other option you have is if you don't have a brake line flare tool kit or you don't wanna mess with flaring your lines, you can simply coil the line here and then tuck it up and zip tie it to this underbody panel here. However, it's gonna be a much cleaner installation and a better look if we go ahead and cut and flare the line here. So that's what we're gonna do next. So now we're gonna take our little T-block, which is included with the kit here. It's gonna have four different ports on there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna thread that, one of this end 
either end, it doesn't matter which way. We're gonna thread that onto the brake line that we just flared here. We're not gonna worry about getting that super tight right now because we still wanna get everything positioned and then we'll come back and tighten everything down. And then what we're gonna do is, we're gonna go ahead and take this port here. We're actually gonna install the rubber hose here from our forwardmost axle. And again, everything's just real loose right now until we get it all in place, and then we can tighten it down. So now we need to go ahead and secure our line here with our lock. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take one of the smaller clamps that go around the brake lines, we're going to go ahead and attach that here. Keep in mind, we don't want to tighten this all the way down because um, it's going to pinch the brake line. If you have some extra washers, those are going to come in handy as well. I'm going to go ahead and install this just to hold everything up into place. Also, if you have trouble um, getting the self-tapping screws into the frame apparel, you can go ahead and drill a pilot hole ahead of time as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and repeat this process in regards to flaring the line that runs between our two axles on the other side of the trailer. One end is gonna go into the line we just flared, which is pointed towards the rear axle here. Then the other end here is gonna be the rubber hose from our braking assembly. That's gonna go to the far end here. So again, we're just gonna loosely thread these into place now. And we see our final line here, that's gonna go across the axle to our other T we installed earlier. But before we move on, we're gonna go ahead and secure this line here to a hole that we have drilled in the frame for this. So as you can see here now, we just went ahead and used a couple zip ties to secure our existing T's and lines here to an existing hose on the trailer here. We were gonna use a hole in the frame of the trailer, but it was pinching our line too much, which is why we just zip tied it here. So as we told you, we're gonna have one fitting left here on our little T-block here. We're also gonna have a couple lines left. Uh, we should have a, a very much longer one that's gonna run from the front of our T to the actuator, and then we should have other one brake line as well, which is what we're gonna use for this next step to bridge our two T's together. So we're gonna simply take one end of our fitting now. We're just gonna loosely install it into our little Y here. Gonna give it a couple turns to tighten it. Now once that's done, we're gonna wanna take this line here. We're gonna run it over to the other side of the trailer. Keep in mind, we are gonna have to find a way to secure it to the underbody here. As you can see here, we have a zip tie holding our brake line to this underbody panel here. Not, there's not really a whole lot of ways we can use to secure our brake line running to the other side. However, this is gonna be the best method. We'll show you real quick how this is done. So what I essentially did is, I'm gonna pick a point about six inches to a foot away from our tie down there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a razor blade and we're gonna cut two slats on either side of our line here into that protective panel. And then what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take a flathead screwdriver and all I'm gonna simply do is, I'm gonna try to loop it through either end of these. So it's gonna try to come in, the one we cut, and come out the other. Just like that. And we can see our screwdriver poking through both ends. So then what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take a zip tie, and we're gonna use that opening we created with our screwdriver to slip it through there. That way we have a nice and easy way to secure it. Once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and clip off the excess. And we can repeat this process about every 12 inches or so until we reach the other side here. So as you can see here, we have a couple zip ties here that are just used to secure our brake line to this bottom panel here. And we just made a little kink in our line here because we had a little bit longer, but it wasn't enough to justify flaring it. So we went ahead and just attached that once we bent it to the block here, which has our other two fittings attached to it as well. And the final fitting we have here, is in this block here, that's gonna be for our longer line with the kit. That's gonna to run to the front of the trailer and to our actuator. Now keep in mind, if you don't wanna run the brake line here under the panel, you can undo some of these fasteners and run it up above there. 
However, that is going to take quite a bit longer because there's going to be quite a few more fasteners you have to do to drop this panel down. So now we went ahead and took our longer brake line here, which is included with the kit. It's going to be going from our T here in front of the uh, forward most axle all the way to the storage compartment under the overhang of our trailer, which is going to house our actuator. So again, we went ahead and unraveled our line here. Now we're going to go ahead and make our connections and then we'll show you along the way where to secure it. So now we're going to start about midway point of the trailer here. As you can see, we have these little storage containers here. We're actually going to need to go over these. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our brake line here. Keep in mind, we have the fitting pressed all the way forward. And now we're just going to feed this up and over these storage containers here. Once we got a handle on it, we should be able to pull it down here. What we're going to do next is we're going to come to the inside of our landing gear leg here, or our jack. Then we're going to route this, pull as much line as we need, so we can reach the fitting in front of our forwardmost axle. We may need to bend the line slightly to get it to conform to the way we need it. Now we can come over here. Once we have the correct amount of line, Go ahead and make our connection here. Again, we may need to bend the line a little bit to get it to sit the way we want. Now we can go ahead and just tighten it down. So now we're going to take our line here. We're going to begin securing it to the bottom of the frame rail. In order to do this, we're gonna take these self-tapping screws and these little clamps which come with our kit here. So we're gonna slide one of those over there like so. We are gonna make a bend here because we don't want it rubbing on that metal. And we're gonna do our best to try to drill into the bottom of the frame here. It is super thick material, so it is gonna take a little bit of force. And keep in mind, again, we don't want to tighten these all the way down. We want to allow some wiggle room so we don't pinch our line. So now that we have this first clamp tight, we're going to go ahead and take some rubber material or even some electrical tape. We're going to go ahead and wrap this brake line here where it meets the frame rail because we don't want it to rub a hole or puncture it. And then we can go ahead and repeat this process using the clamps that come with the kit and self-tapping screws and secure our brake line to the bottom of our frame rail here. I would recommend about every 12 inches we have a new ring clamp to make sure it's nice and secure. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. Now just to show you here, a couple of the tie downs we used, those C clamps running all the way to the front of the trailer actually have them spaced about two feet apart, which is still going to be fine. It's a really thick frame rail here, so it's hard to drill into. So we tried to minimize that as much as possible. And we see we have our final clamp here, which is going to lead us to the front of the trailer. So we're going to show you how to get this line up into the trailer now where our actuator is going to be. So here under the loft, we have our storage compartment and our fifth wheel. And this is where we're going to locate the actuator. Now we have our brake line sort of ran just loosely under this location here, but we need to get it up in this compartment. And this bottom panel here is made out of wood, so it's going to be a lot easier to drill through than some of the metal components we have through the side here. So we went ahead and just roughly placed our actuator where we think it needed to be. And now what we're going to do is we went ahead and make a mark here. We're going to drill a hole here using a step drill bit so we can then run our brake line from underneath the trailer inside the storage compartment here, we can attach it to our actuator. So now you can see we have our hole drilled here. So we're ready to route our brake line from underneath the trailer into the storage compartment here. But we have quite a bit of excess. So again, if you don't want to do any cutting and flaring, you could easily just coil this line to avoid that. However, since we have the tools on hand, and it's a fairly simple process to do, at this time, we're going to go ahead and cut off some of the excess so we can easily, more easily route the brake line into our storage compartment here without having to make any coils. 
So as you can see, we have our line trimmed here. So what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna go underneath. We're gonna slip it through the hole. Try not to make too many sharp bends. So now that we have all of our brake lines ran, we can go ahead and move on to the installation of our electric over hydraulic actuator. We need to find a place to mount our actuator here. We're gonna be mounting it under the front overhang of our fifth wheel trailer here. We also need to keep in mind, we are gonna be limited to where our brake line is ran. So we already have our brake line ran up into this loft here. So that's not gonna give us many places to mount our actuator. We sort of picked a location that's toward the side out of the way we can still run all of our wires. So the first thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna remove this red plug here on the end of our actuator. Keep in mind, some brake fluid is probably gonna spill out, so we can just easily clean that up. So once we have our red cap removed, we can go ahead and attach our brake line fitting to our actuator. And we can tighten it down with our 3 8 wrench. And that's gonna then determine the place that we're gonna mount our actuator here. Once that's nice and tight, we go ahead and line up the actuator here. Next thing we're gonna do is, we still have four holes, two on the back, two on the front. We're gonna take some self-tapping screws. We're gonna use these holes to secure our actuator to this bottom panel here. Keep in mind, our self-tapping screws aren't gonna come with the kit. So we do need to supply these ourselves. So now the next step here, once we have our actuator mounted, we need to go ahead and begin running the rest of our wires. We're gonna take our black wire, which is gonna be run to the, v, or to the trailer's 12 volt battery. In order to do this, we're gonna need some extra 10 gauge wire. So the first thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna attach a butt connector to the end of our black wire here. We're gonna crimp that on like so. Give it a good little jiggle to make sure it's on there securely. Then we're gonna take some of the extra wire we had laying around and attach this to the yellow butt connector. So before we route our black power wire to the battery, we're gonna go ahead and combine this with our white wire, which is for the ground. Since these are both gonna be ran to the same place, which is our battery, the white wire is gonna be attached to the negative battery terminal, whereas the positive wire is gonna be attached to the positive battery terminal with our circuit breaker in between. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna extend this white wire now, similar to how we did with our black power wire. Now that we have both of our power and ground wires extended, we're then going to route them now to our battery bank. We have a small access hole here. You may or may not need to drill one yourself, but we're gonna feed our wires through so they can then go to the battery. We are gonna leave ourselves some slack so we still have a place to hide the wires. Now that we have the power through, we're gonna go ahead and run our ground as well. Keep in mind, whenever we have wires going through sharp metal here, it's always gonna be a good idea to sort of cover those up. We're just gonna be using some gasket maker so we don't have to worry about the metal piercing the jacket on our wire and causing a short. So before we go ahead and connect our power and ground wires to the battery, what I'm gonna do next is, I'm just gonna clean up some of our wires here with some wire loom and some electrical tape. So we're gonna do that and show you how it's done. So as you can see here, we just use some wire loom, which keep in mind if you don't have any at home, we do sell this here at E-Trailer, as well as some ring clamps here to just secure our wire to this back panel here for a nice clean finished install look. So now we went ahead and routed our black and white wires here out towards our batteries here we can go ahead and begin making our connections. The first one we're gonna do is the white wire, which is gonna be attached to the negative terminal on our battery here. So we're gonna make sure we have the correct length, probably have a little bit more than what we need, so we can definitely trim some of this excess off. And then, like we've been doing, we're gonna go ahead and strip some of the jacket free, 
This time we're going to be using a ring terminal here. Get crimped that on there like so. Once that's on there nice and tight, we can go ahead and remove the nut to the negative terminal on our battery here. This particular nut takes a 13 millimeter socket. We're going to take our ground wire here. We're going to attach it to that stud on our battery, just like so. We can take our nut and we can tighten it back down. Just like that. So now we have our black wire left to connect. However, if you remember, we do need a circuit breaker in between the positive post on the battery and our black wire. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to find a general location where we can mount our circuit breaker. It's going to be in reach of our black wire and the positive terminal on our battery. So once we do have a good location, we're just going to take some self-tapping screws and attach the circuit breaker. Just like that. So now that we have our circuit breaker in place, we're going to go ahead and touch the black wire from the actuator to the silver post here labeled auxiliary. We'll cut the correct amount, give ourselves a little bit of room to work with. Now we're going to splice on a ring terminal. We are going to be using a ring terminal for the smaller studs, keep in mind. Once that's on there, we can go ahead and attach it. Then re-secure our nut here. We're going to tighten that nut down with a 10 millimeter socket. Just like that. Then finally, we have our bronze post here, labeled battery, which is going to go to the positive battery terminal. So we're going to remove the nut. And then just take some extra wire here and crimp on ring terminals onto both ends. I'm going to start by attaching the ring terminal on the circuit breaker here and tightening down our nut. Once that's tight, now we're going to loosen the nut from the positive post on our battery here, making sure we don't come into contact with any metal with our wrench. Attach that like so, and just simply reinstall our nut. Just like that. So now that we have our power and ground wires ran, we're gonna have two wires left coming off our actuator here. We have the blue wire, which is for the brake output circuit. And then we have the yellow wire here, which is gonna to go to our breakaway switch. So in order to get these wires run up to the front of the trailer, we're gonna to have to step back a little bit towards the loft here. As you can see here, we have our pin box here. This is where we're gonna access the brake output wire as well as our breakaway switch. However, we need to get our wires from the actuator up to here. And how we're gonna do that is, we're gonna take a pole wire here. Now pole wire is any sort of long object such as this airline tubing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use this to feed the wires under this loft here or above this loft here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a part of our airline tubing. We're gonna sort of fish it up in here. Any sort of opening we can find. And then we're gonna begin pushing it back to try to get it to come out in this little storage compartment here. So we went ahead and ran our pole line under the loft on this overhang here. We were actually able to find it there in the storage compartment on the trailer. However, I do want to note that we did switch to more of a wire type construction because the airline tubing was just sort of curling up there. So you're going to get a little bit easier time here with this uh, metal rod. What we're going to do is we're just going to tape our wire here, try to get it nice and secure. That way when we pull the other end of the pole line through, can get our wire on the other side. Hopefully our wire doesn't come off. 
I'm going to take the other end of our wire here. I'm going to tie it to a point here. So when we do go inside and pull our pull wire through, we don't pull the end of our wire back up into the loft here. So we went ahead and we took our two wires that we ran down here earlier. Keep in mind, we're going to be using a green wire and a yellow wire. The yellow wire is going to go to the yellow wire on our actuator, and the green wire is going to go to the blue wire actuator. Now you can use whatever color you like. If you have some extra blue and yellow wire laying around, that'll be ideal because you don't have to worry about mixing the colors up. So your setup may look a little bit different than ours here. Um, for this particular trailer, we were having trouble finding the junction box for the trailer lights. So what we did is we took our trailer connector here, which we see going up into the loft there. And what we did, we just went ahead and cut that in half and we installed one of our junction boxes here. Now, if you want to do this method, it's not required, but you can pick one of these up here at eTrailer. The other option would be to just separate some of the sheathing here, because what we need to do on the trailer connector is we need to isolate this blue wire here. So you have a couple different options. You can use a junction box like we did we're going to attach our green wire because remember we're going to be using this for the brake output circuit from our actuator. We're going to be attaching this to the stud for the brake output. However, another option you have if you don't want to install a junction box, which is just going to give it a little bit of a cleaner look right here, easier to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. The other option you have is you can separate the sheathing like we said. We can locate this blue wire here, which we know is for the brake output circuit. What you can do is you can cut this in half and you can tape up one side. This is going to be a dead circuit because it normally goes back to the electric brakes, which we removed. However, we're going to take this end, which comes from the trailer connector. We're going to attach our green wire that we pulled through earlier, and then we're going to use that to connect to the actuator. So again, you have a little bit of a choice here, but we're going to be using a junction box. So at this time, we're just going to go ahead and splice a ring terminal over this green wire here and attach it to our brake output stud. Place that on there like so, and we can follow it up with our other blue wires. So for our final wire here, we have this yellow wire, which keep in mind is going to be going to the breakaway switch wire on our actuator. So what we need to do is, we need to go ahead and tie this into our breakaway switch. The breakaway switch is fairly easy to find. It's going to be on the exterior of our trailer here, up towards the pin box. But what we need to do is, we usually, almost all breakaway switches have two wires, two wire design. What we need to do is, we need to find the cold side of the wire, or the one that doesn't have power while the pin is in. Because that's the one that we're going to be splicing into with our yellow wire. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to take a circuit tester here, and I'm going to test one of these wires to see which one is hot. Yep, so we know our orange wire is the hot wire. Let's go ahead and test the black one again just to double check. Yep, so we don't have power going to the black wire, so that's going to be the cold side of our breakaway switch. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our yellow wire here, and we're going to splice it in to the black wire going from our breakaway switch. So we're just going to take a pair of cutters here. We're just going to snip this wire. Let's go back here. So this other end, we can cap off. We're not going to need it. Whereas our yellow wire is going to go to our black wire here. I'll just cut the appropriate mount, and I'll strip both of these ends and attach them with a the butt connector. So because we have the exterior of the trailer here, we're going to go ahead and wrap our butt connector here with some electrical tape. Bear in mind, you can use heat shrink butt connectors as well. We just need to make sure any wire connections on the outside of the trailer are going to be nice, secure, and free of any corrosion. We're actually just going to be reinstalling the factory loom that went to our breakaway switch wires. So now that leaves us with the free end of our black wire from our breakaway switch. What we're going to do is we're just going to tape this up and then tuck it back up with the rest of the wires in case we need to reuse it down the road. So our next step here is we can go ahead and take our wire leads. 
we're gonna route these over across a little loft area. We're gonna come down in the back corner here where our remaining two wires are. However, since we want everything to have like a clean finished install look, we're again gonna be taking some wire loom. And we're gonna cover these wires here before we route them over to that corner. But it's also not required either. So you could just go ahead and run your wires without this. So now that we have our wire loom installed, we can go ahead and route this over to the actuator here. Now I did some thinking and it looks like the best route to take is, there's actually a cross beam right behind above this panel here, which we're gonna secure our wire loom to. We're gonna use this to run all the way to the corner here. And then we're gonna drop it straight down in this little crevice here. We should be able to get a nice, neat, clean little path here to the rest of our wires. So I'm just gonna take some zip ties now. I'm gonna secure our loom to this cross beam up here. So now, once we have our wire ran over to the side, I'm just gonna tuck it into this nice little crevice here. Nice and tight fit. We don't have to worry about it coming free. And then I think what we're gonna do is, rather than have it dangling down here, I think if we come up and across here, we're gonna use a couple ring clamps here. It should lead us right to where we need it. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take some ring clamps here, just gonna attach a couple to these wires and drill into this panel here. So now that we have our wires in one place here, as you can see, we have quite a bit of excess. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and clip both of these. Then I'm going to clip this as well. And then we can make our connections here. Keep in mind, we're gonna be going yellow to yellow and green to blue, or whichever color you used to connect to our break output circuit. Here you can see we have our splices made. So again, like we've been doing, I'm just gonna come back with our wire loom here, some electrical tape, just clean everything up for a nice finished install look. And once this is all done, you can go ahead and fill our actuator up with some brake fluid and test everything out. Now with all of our electrical connections made, we can go ahead and fill the reservoir on our actuator here with the correct brake fluid, which is gonna be dot three or dot four. Then we can test everything out. So now we can go ahead, once we've filled our reservoir for the brake fluid, we can go ahead and send a brake signal to our actuator to see if it powers on. Now we have a couple different options for this. The first option is, if we don't have the tow vehicle nearby, we can go ahead and pull the pin on our breakaway switch as that should send 12 volt power to our actuator to kick on. Now another method we have, if we do have the tow vehicle here, is we can plug into the tow vehicle, we can turn our brake controller all the way up, and then we can hit the manual override on the brake controller to send a signal to our actuator here. However, when we do send that signal, we want it to be a very short signal, because what's gonna happen now is all of our lines are dry, there's no fluid in them. So as soon as we turn on our actuator there, it's gonna almost completely empty, which we don't want it to go all the way down we're gonna suck air into our lines. So we're just gonna turn the, second, the system on for a split second to ensure everything's working. So we should distinctively hear our actuator kick on. And we do, so now we know everything's working correctly. So now that we've verified our hydraulic actuator is functioning properly, the first thing we're gonna do in regards to bleeding is we need to bleed the actuator up here first. Then once we do that, we're gonna jump back and bleed each of our four disparate calibers. We'll show you how to do that now. Now in order to do this, we're gonna need a couple things. We're gonna need a 5 16 inch wrench. We're also gonna need some sort of air trap device so we don't have air sucking back in the bleeder screws. We're just using an empty bottle here with some hose. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna need a helper for this. We're gonna need someone at the front of the trailer and we're gonna need to signal them when we wanna engage the brakes. We showed you a couple methods for that earlier. You could use the brake controller on the vehicle or you can use the breakaway switch. So what we're gonna do is, keep in mind, we wanna start at the rearmost braking assemblies and work our way up. We're gonna place our hose over the top bleeder screw here as best we can, and we wanna take our wrench, and we wanna to begin to loosen that, and then we can give a signal to our helper. Okay, you can go ahead and engage the brakes. And what we're looking for is a steady stream of fluid. When we have a steady stream of fluid, 
we know that our brakes have been bled correctly. So now that we have one of our disc brake calibers bled, we want to go ahead and repeat this process on the other side, starting with our rearmost axle, then work our way forward. And now the final step of our installation here is going to be to reinstall our tires and wheels back on our trailer, and then we're ready to hit the road.